Hello everyone, I think we are live. This is the pre-stream. I'm just checking some audio levels, so we'll start in, uh, let's say, five minutes. stream good afternoon to our north american viewers and a good evening for europe play my own audio back to me for a minute back to me for a minute okay i'm gonna pick my mic up testing 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 okay so flammable says i'm controlling the youtube share activity on discord uh is it able to play a live stream of that i'm not certain Let's see if I can just pop the link in here. No. Okay, so if um, so, if I mute this on Discord, does it mute it for everyone, or is it just for me? Because otherwise, I'm getting the live stream two or three times on my own PC, and it's gonna loop back on itself. Okay, seems our audio levels are matching. Uh, let me pop open our files for the day. That is going to be a Kaiserreich documentary 60, June 16, June 12th render here. And trailer. There we go. Maybe get the thumbnail up here. That would be good. Uh, documentary thumbnail episode six. Pop that in there. Okay, I'm pretty much ready to go. I'll uh, put you guys live. Uh, let's say in one minute. Just one or two things. A seventy. So a reminder that we are doing a Q and A session after the viewing of the full episode. So if you have questions, uh, make sure to post them in the YouTube chat. I'll be taking your questions.
So Thorpear Thorpearon asks, uh, what episode is a documentary about the Ottoman Empire? So that is going to be a documentary episode seven. It's the one we're currently researching and writing. So this is episode six. So next episode will be Middle Eastern uh, Ottoman Empire focused. There we go. Okay, I'm taking us live in, let's say, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. So uh, for everyone on Discord, uh, if you are talking, you're going to be on stream. So feel free to join the conversation. So a good afternoon to North America, a good evening in Europe. This is the live stream premiere of Kaiser Documentary, episode 6. As usual, there is going to be one or two uh, streaming shenanigans, as we do with Guys Cat Cinema. So if you uh, notice anything strange, like audio that is out of sync, just let me know in the YouTube comments, and I will uh, try and fix things on my end. It's been a while since I streamed, so I'm going to see if all my settings are correct. With that being said, let me switch you to my screen. What we are doing today, it is of course a documentary about Austria-Hungary. So it's a one-hour documentary. Uh, I'd say, you know, I have my drinks here. Uh, grab yours, grab a snack, you know, we're gonna be here for a while. Uh, this documentary episode specifically is about Austria-Hungary, Central Europe. It features uh, basically post-rework Austria-Hungary and Central Europe lore. Uh, more specifically, we have Austria-Hungary's internal politics its relations to its own uh, sphere and close neighbors. Italy is in here, uh, Romania is in here, Albania is in here, as well as Serbia. The next episode, so that's gonna be uh, episode seven, will cover the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Greece, and the Middle East, uh, depending on how far we get in, probably gonna be another 45 minute video. But now, for the next hour, we will focus exclusively on Austria-Hungary and everything going on in Central Europe from uh, 1916 through to 1936. Mm. So, we have a dev Q&A right after uh, the full video has premiered. Uh, so if you have questions, just let me know. You can put them on Discord, you can put them on the uh, YouTube live stream in the comments. I will be watching, I will be responding to them. Uh, that's pretty much all I want to say. I think we can start the episode. So, a uh, 60 minute episode, the Q&A segment will begin right after. There will also be a poster giveaway. Uh, how to participate in a poster giveaway, I will let you know after the episode. Uh, it is not going to be a prize question because a user came in and uh, suggested something, but you know, I'll see you in an hour and I'll explain how that is going to work. So, uh, thank you for being with us this fine afternoon or evening, depending on where you live. I would say uh, thank you for supporting Guys Get Cinema and enjoy the show. Blah. And enjoy the show. Here we go. Honorable colleagues of the Reichsrat, some among you call me young and vicious, even impetuous and rash. But I stand here today as a representative of the Progressive Party. I stand here to represent our hopes for the future. During this Weltkrieg, the Empire has bled and suffered. Let this sacrifice mean something. To the honorable members, I propose the following. We must go forward as an alliance of equals, a great Danubian federation at the heart of Europe. Look out the window, honorable members. There can be no pretense that the status quo is sustainable. Two dozen nationalities squabble while the nation stagnates. Your decisions today shape our collective futures, not just our own, but those of our children and grandchildren. Will they grow up without fear of war? Will they grow up to see a future where every man is equal, regardless of language or class? Or will this parliament entrench the old ways that have failed us? On all sides, our empire is surrounded by revanchists, extremists, and demagogues. But the true enemy sits inside this very parliament. Honorable colleagues of the Reichsrat, Austria-Hungary stands on the precipice. A house divided cannot stand. Choose the old ways, and our empire will rot from within. Choose Federation, and the world will witness the writing of a new chapter for Europe. 
penned by our many nations combined. Only in unity can we achieve greatness. Only in unity can we guide Europe to real peace and prosperity. I implore you all to choose progress, to choose federation. Let the historians write that it was Austria-Hungary that led the world into modernity. That we embraced the bright flames of progress. That we did so while the arrogant Germans guarded their precious nobility. The decrepit Kaiserreich. The story of Austria-Hungary, in many ways, is the story of the House of Habsburg. The vaunted family spread its roots throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and became a powerhouse of Central European politics for much of European history. While the family would breed many rulers, much of their power became concentrated in Vienna, later capital of the Austrian Empire. Here they forged Austria as the successor state to the Holy Roman Empire absorbing enormous territories on both banks of the Danube. Later, the crown allied with the Hungarian nobility, forming the world's most prominent dual monarchy. This federal monarchist state would henceforth be known as Austria-Hungary. By the turn of the 20th century, however, the emerging idea of the nation-state threatened the multilingual empires of old. Austria-Hungary, beaten twice by Prussia, watched helplessly as her northern dependencies were forged into the formidable German Empire. The ambitious Germans united a powerful centralized administration and began industrializing at breakneck speed. Austria-Hungary, with her poor rural areas and vast unconnected territories, would slowly slide away and become a second-rate power in Europe. The Empire, which, less than a hundred years before, orchestrated the reigning order of Europe, now seemed an embodiment of the kind of decrepit feudalism from which it had emerged. As kindred peoples united in brand new nation-states, Austria-Hungary desperately tried to hold its many minorities under the imperial crown's sway. Soon, the empire was viewed with contempt, both within and outside her borders. The dual monarchy was loathed by Russia and the Balkans, preyed upon by Italy, and despised by revolutionaries. By the time of Franz Ferdinand's assassination, the opening shot of the Great War, Vienna had become dependent on German economic and military aid. The ancient rivalry with Prussia had become an alliance, yes, but a fraught one all the same. The central powers rallied behind Germany out of necessity, and shared enmity for the Entente, but there was little love lost between them. Victory in the Great War would do little to settle the internal troubles of the Federated State. Austria-Hungary's performance in the Weltkrieg had made the Empire a laughing stock internationally and fueled internal dissent on how the country was managed. Things would come to a head in 1916 with the death of the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph. In November 1916, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria, died old and bitter. Riddled with pneumonia, many in the press likened the monarch to the sickly empire he led. Already in 1916, it wouldn't have surprised observers to see his struggling empire follow its emperor into the grave. Few, if any, in Vienna, Budapest, Prague, or Zagreb, could even fathom the empire without Franz Joseph at the helm. As the people mourned their late emperor, the unprepared Karl ascended the throne, becoming sovereign of the Austrian and Hungarian realms. Franz Joseph's only son, Rudolf, had ended his own life many years before. The late emperor's brother had died soon after, 
and his nephew's untimely end famously led to the Weltkrieg. Only the heir presumptive for two years, Karl had barely been initiated into the business of ruling the chaotic nation, if at all. The task Karl faced was an unenviable one. Ever since the Ausgleich negotiations that established the dual monarchy, the empire had been walking on a tightrope. If the crown catered to the whims of the old German elite, it would risk upsetting the Hungarians, Slavic insurgents, or even Democrats in the parliament. If they instead chose federation, it would unravel the web of hereditary dependencies that still governed much of the realms. It seemed a political wind either way could sweep away the empire, and so Austria-Hungary stumbled on, mockingly called the second sick man of Europe, by both friends and allies. Although nearly everyone agreed that reforms were necessary, none could really agree on how those reforms should take shape. Progress in Vienna was made in inches, while the larger issues remained open. Austria had adopted a parliamentary system, which paralyzed itself over Bohemian language rights. Hungary, on the other hand, became a virtual one-party state, as conservative elements conspired to keep the status quo intact. The Weltkrieg did not do the dual monarchy stability any favors. Any notion that Austria was moving from a German autocracy to a more federal, multicultural and democratic entity quickly dissipated. The Austrian Prime Minister, Karl von Stürck, enforced a deeply conservative and pro-German cabinet, which dictated Austrian decision-making by decree. Hungary did not fare better. Although Budapest allowed for more freedoms than Vienna, the Magyar lands were far from a democracy. The Hungarian half was deeply conservative, inflexible, and reliant on the old landowner rights of the aristocracy. István Tisza, the Hungarian prime minister, relied on covert and secretive tactics to keep his coalition secure, including gerrymandering and restrictive suffrage. With democracy on the decline, confidence in Vienna reached rock bottom. In Prague, representatives took to the street against their lack of voice and the authoritarian policies of the regime. In Budapest, the ruling coalition feared the dissent would spill over, even as famine loomed. And all the while, the Italians, Russians and Romanians broke down the gates of the dual monarchy, eager to exploit its weakened state. The closing war years were marked with a rapid succession of parliamentary crises for the struggling empire. For the Habsburg domain to survive the Weltkrieg, bold action was not just necessary, it was vital. With few other options, the young emperor embarked on a series of reforms aiming to stem the turmoil in the Danubian monarchy and save Austria-Hungary from imminent collapse. Some time earlier, Prime Minister Stürk had been assassinated by political rivals. The Austrian Emperor decided to instate Heinrich von Klam Martinich to lead a reformist cabinet. However, to restore Parliament, Emperor Karl still required the backing of the German nationalists. These radical factions had no great love for the progressive overtures of the Crown. For their political support, they demanded a heavy price. In exchange for backing the new administration, the Emperor would have to press a long-time nationalist demand, the so-called Bohemian Question. German would have to become the sole official language of the Austrian half of the Empire for the nationalist bloc to agree to any restoration of Parliament. Naturally, this upset not only the Czechs, but also the Polish, Ukrainians, Slovenes and Croats. Klam Martinich would end up recalling Parliament with the promise to give in to the German nationalist demands. However, the cabinet wavered and walked back their promises in the 11th hour. Many saw this as weak and backhanded governance, unbefitting the offices of the Minister President of Austria. Soon Klam Martinich found himself with neither support nor credibility in the Reichrat, the Austrian Parliament. His government fell not a month into his premiership, 
and Plan Martinich was replaced by the German-backed Ernst Zeidler. The new Prime Minister did not fare better. Zeidler was largely incompetent and unable to navigate between the Germans and the other ethnicities of the Empire. Despite his shortcomings, Zeidler's leadership continued, mostly as a result of Great War politics. The German Kaiser had openly threatened Emperor Karl not to replace Zeidler with the progressive Josef Redlich, who was strongly in favour of imperial reorganisation. Zeidler would eventually be sacked at the end of the war and not remembered fondly. Despite his black sheep status, Zeidler had made vital reforms to the food office during his term. His policies here engineered the so-called bread peace that would help Austria-Hungary through its darkest and coldest days in the final years of the war. The Hungarian part of the empire was plagued with much the same issues as Vienna. While Karl managed to rid himself of the chauvinistic and inflexible Tisza regime, there was no Hungarian faction strong enough to fill the resulting power vacuum. Eventually, the conservative but pragmatic statesman Sandor Vekerla took charge of Hungary. While Vekerla was definitely a conservative, he still proved far more flexible on key issues plaguing the realm. Even though his mandate within Hungary remained small, Vekerla achieved minor reforms to suffrage law and deepened Croatian autonomy. This would lay the groundwork for the creation of the Illyrian crown later, a major breakthrough for modernizing the Austro-Hungarian state. The third year of the Great War in Austria-Hungary was marked by slow political progress and surprising battlefield successes. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk had knocked the Russians out of the war, followed soon by the beleaguered Romanians. Suddenly, two flanks of the empire were secured and only the Italian front remained. Despite these windfalls, the empire remained deeply paralyzed. A new political bloc was rising to force a breakthrough in the deadlocked parliaments of Austria and Hungary. This breakthrough would come from the streets with two words that every politician dreads. General Strike. The honorable member from Styria objects to the motion. The motion fails. They should make those lines the anthem. From some far-flung area of the empire, Lord Something blocks any and all plans and nothing happens. How are we supposed to trust a place like that? That can systematically get absolutely nothing done for us. It's like they're in a different world. We could not care less about the policies of the Empire. We care about paying our bills! The Kaiser and the Emperor work us for their moronic conflict. They send our sons to die against the Russians and the Italians. But are we heard? <laughs> As if! No. We're just supposed to suck it up and work endlessly building their cars and their guns and their shells, while the nobility gets to sit in their fancy houses, send their kids to a fancy school, get a fancy job arguing fancy nonsense in their fancy house. And who could even blame them? If they are never exposed to what life is really like here, why would they care? We should go to Vienna and make our voices heard. We are with many. We can grind the gears of the Empire to a halt, and it's been enough! Brothers of Budapest, brothers of Prague, will we let the elites dictate what our lives are like? Or will we finally, after all these years, do what the councils never managed to do? Will we at last free the working men of Austria from this aristocratic yoke? Enough, brothers! Let us lay down our tools! I call for a strike! A general strike! The general strike of 1918, better known as the Jana Strike, could have been the death knell for the struggling empire. Instead, Vienna was on the cusp of an early spring, 
at least politically. By this point, Russia and Romania had been knocked out of the war, and Italy was already on the back foot. The front lines of the Weltkrieg were moving even farther away from the borders of Austria-Hungary, and the country was in high spirits. In Vienna, victory was in the air. Quick concessions to the workers would extend the lifeline of the empire once more. Under the Redlich ministry, municipal electoral law was democratized, as local diets of the empire's many crown lands introduced universal suffrage. Democratic elections were announced for 1919, and a reformist mood overtook the Austrian part of the empire. It was not just Austria, however, that experienced a swing towards reformism. In the whole empire, the status quo was rapidly changing. Already in 1918, the prime ministers of Austria and Hungary had agreed to create a new constituent kingdom, Illyria. This kingdom consisted of the lands inhabited by Slovenes, Croats, Bosnians and Serbs from both Austrian and Hungarian territory. Although the new kingdom was nascent and troubled, the introduction of a Yugoslav kingdom in personal union with Hungary did much to ease Slavic tensions. In the north, too, Slavic reformists would get their wish. A constituent Bohemian kingdom would be re-established to appease the Czech people. While German nationalists remained staunchly opposed to Bohemia's creation, they had become politically marginalized following the election of 1919. The land of the crown of Wenceslas, as Bohemia was formerly known, crowned Karl its king on September 28, 1920. After this wave of progressive reform, the political pendulum would swing again. In outrage, reactionary and conservative Germans conspired to take down the Redlich ministry. The radical right wing of the empire attempted a reversal of the reforms that had empowered Bohemia and Illyria. Although the nationalist bloc succeeded in taking down the governing coalition, they soon found out they had overplayed their hand. When the general public came to the vote, it was the nationalists that were blamed for causing yet another round of political squabbling. The election that followed produced a surprise victor. Popular support had not gone to the conservatives, nor even the progressives, but rather the rising social democratic front. The emperor, in his elation, assigned Karl Renner to form a left-leaning cabinet despite the syndicalist revolutions that had shocked France and Italy some time before. This swing to the left was to the chagrin of the German Kaiserreich, which had grown paranoid of syndicalist incursion into her own language sphere. Relations between Austria-Hungary and Germany had become polite at best, and the idea that Vienna would seek closer cooperation with France made the German nobility nervous. In German newspapers, the Austrian emperor was mockingly called Comrade Karl, or, sordidly, the Socialist Emperor. At the time, it seemed like the chaotic years that followed the Janusstreik and the Great War had solidified Austria-Hungary's evolution into a democratic federation of equals. In many provinces, Austrian and Hungarian chauvinism had given way to the popular Social Democratic Party, riding a wave of reformist fervor. Renner, who had become Prime Minister in the electoral upset of 1921, wasted no time trying to solve many core issues that plagued the Empire. Many were worried that the Socialist Renner Ministry would inevitably drive the Empire into syndicalist arms. In truth, however, the Social Democrats mostly shied away from major political reforms. The only true break with tradition Renner achieved was the enfranchisement of women. The ministry focused mostly on socio-economic reforms, the accessibility to social housing in cities like Vienna, Salzburg and Graz was expanded, schools and kindergartens were secularized and the taxation system underwent a major overhaul to better suit Austria's new finances. In Hungary, too, a reformist mood set had overtaken the country. 
After years of conservative progressive domination, the failure of the coalition to meet popular expectations led to a victory of the Social Democratic Party under Mihaly Karolyi. Similar to Austria in earlier years, Hungary greatly democratized after the election of 1922, with universal suffrage finally introduced. Furthermore, Karolyi began undercutting the long-held power of the aristocracy by introducing major land reforms, which would dwindle the power of the landholding class. Under Karolyi, the so-called Aponyi laws were repealed. These had been a prominent aspect of the pro-Hungarian Magyarization policy of the last decade. They were a series of laws that had severely oppressed non-Hungarian minorities in its half of the empire. Removing the Aponyi laws extended an olive branch to minorities inside the Hungarian crown lands. Additionally, both Vienna and Budapest pushed back against militarist traditions which had severely undermined civilian rule and peace before and during the Weltkrieg. Seeing the military budget as increasingly unnecessary, a sense of peace and prosperity under responsible and representative government washed over the Danubian monarchy. But this era of optimism would, in the end, prove mostly gilded. Karolyi's ambitious government overstretched itself and quickly faltered against conservative resistance. In Austria, the death blow for the socialist experiment came quickly and unexpectedly. When in 1926 a general strike in the United Kingdom turned violent, wildcat strikes throughout Austria-Hungary sprang up in sympathy with British workers. While the government both silently and explicitly condoned the strikes, they faced increasing backlash from anti-syndicalist voices in the empire, which united under the conservative parties of the empire's constituent realms. It would not be long until the British strikes had turned into a full-blown revolution. As British aristocrats and royalists fled to holdouts across the empire, panic swept the conservative ranks of the Habsburg domain. Led by the devout Catholic Ignaz Zipo, Austrian conservatives started to pressure the emperor to dismiss Renner, fearing that Austria's fate was soon to share Britain's. The emperor, although startled by the revolt, refused to dismiss Renner. He had fought hard to restore the parliamentary system in his early reign, and he was unwilling to undo years of progress by interfering now. Despite the Emperor's support, Renner's government collapsed quickly after British syndicalists proclaimed the Union of Britain. Swept up in their victory in Britain, some factions within syndicalist France and Britain dared utter the words, World Revolution. In truth, those factions were political fringe movements at best. Despite this, the conservative newspapers and radios ran with the story, with enthusiastic support of the German Kaiserreich. The wildcat strikes in Austria were dispersed, and in a tide of anti-syndicalist sentiment, the conservatives swept to power. Syndicalism was now the unifying enemy, and the Austro-Hungarian pendulum had swung again. In Hungary, Karolyi's government collapsed with an even bigger bang. While Renner had largely remained silent on the wildcat strikes, Karolyi explicitly endorsed the British revolutionaries. After calling for a general strike in sympathy with the syndicalists in the United Kingdom, his coalition shattered almost immediately. As chaos erupted in the streets of Budapest, the Prime Minister was ousted in a vote of no confidence. The Hungarian gendarmerie battled with pro-syndicalist strikers in the streets of the Hungarian capital. Following the chaos, numerous prominent Hungarian leftists fled the country for the Commune of France, in the hope of mounting syndicalist resistance from abroad. The progressive days of the Danubian monarchy were numbered, as new, conservative, highly anti-syndicalist cabinets were formed throughout the realm. It was summer, I think, or at least a very warm spring. I was preparing the fields for the sowing when I spotted a large column of trucks speeding toward the capital. It was quite a sight, I can tell you that. Even during the Weltkrieg, I'd never seen that much armor near the estate, 
The fighting was always far away, in Poland, Transylvania, and the Alps. Now it seemed like the war had come to Hungary. I wouldn't have given it much thought, were it not for the terrifying national address the Emperor had given the day before. Riots in Budapest, he had said. The socialist had taken to the streets. That no good jobless rebel. That's what you get for allying yourself with the Reds, I remember thinking. Our fool of an emperor, Comrade Karl, who gladly accepted the reforms of these snakes in the grass. The local pastor was right, I tell you. Never trust a socialist. They promised us they were nothing like the French or British syndicalists. No, their aim was not revolution, but reform, you see. <laughs> and all the good it did us. The minute that left this rabble saw the winds turn against them, they reached for rifles all the same. No good, jobless, loft socialist, syndicalist, Mark Sol, call it anarchist, Jacobins. Rats, the whole lot of them. Rats who deny the Hungarian way, the true way. We are simple people. We have no interest in these Western European fancies of socialism. One people, one nation, and only God can give the right to rule. That's the creed I live by. <laughs> I heard the leftists learned that lesson well that day. The city kids from Budapest, Pozhonye, uh, Kolozvar, got the hard end of a baton, the cold inside of a cell, and their entire government collapsed and fled. <laughs> now, Hungary is once again led by God-fearing men, and the socialist experiment is over. Good riddance, I say. Long live Hungary, and long live the old way. The syndicalist revolution had upset the political trajectory of the Habsburg Empire. After conservatives had regained their power in both halves of the empire, a veritable red scare swept across the nation. Conservatives and reactionaries refused to cooperate with the Social Democrats in nearly all matters, fearing that any concession would pave the way for another syndicalist revolution. The groundbreaking progressive reforms of the Social Democrats had ground to a halt. In Hungary, the chaotic collapse of the socialist Karolyi regime had left a bitter taste, and Hungary turned instead to the old establishment, and did so quite literally. In 1926, at the age of 81, Olbert Aponyi rose to power again. The aging conservative led a cabinet stacked to the brim with anti-socialists and Hungarian nationalists. Despite this, Aponyi returned to the political stage to reshape his legacy into that of a moderate conservative. In the closing chapter of his life, Aponyi wanted to become the architect of a new political consensus. Such ambition was met with derision from the realm's many minorities. To minorities in Hungary, Aponyi was an architect indeed, the architect of the hated Aponyi laws. These repressive Hungarization laws were removed by the previous regime, though, true to his word, Aponyi did not reinstate them. Perhaps the wisdom of age had indeed softened the grand old man of Europe. The new Hungary was much like the old Hungary, but bolstered by the public fear of syndicalism. Those not with the consensus, it was said, were with the Internationale. Aponyi enjoyed wide popular support as he began rolling back much of the reforms of the Hungarian socialists. Hungary was returned to its pre-1921 state, a highly nationalistic, aristocratic and pro-Hungarian realm. Fearing the syndicalists more than their own elite, many welcomed the sense of normalcy the government seemed to offer. The conservative government was further bolstered by steady economic growth. Both in Austria and Hungary, the standards of living had been rising and business was booming. Radios, vacuum cleaners and electronic lighting became increasingly common in the vast nation. Although the conservative ministries took the credit for the prosperity of the late 1920s, much of it was only possible thanks to the reforms of the years prior, and such progress would prove to be rather fragile indeed. Dark clouds were gathering outside of the empire as well. 
By the 1920s, cracks were forming in the fragile sphere of influence Austria-Hungary has gained from victory in the Weltkrieg. To understand the dual monarchy's precarious position on the world stage, we must dial back to 1919 and the end of the Great War. When the Habsburg domain emerged from the Weltkrieg, it was not in any condition to annex vast swathes of land as the Kaiser had done. The Empire chose to only minimally adjust the border with Romania and annexed some territory in Montenegro. While the Bulgarian Empire to its south vastly overstretched itself, Austria-Hungary took a more careful approach. Like the famous Metternich had done just over a century before, Austria-Hungary would find its power not through military, but through diplomatic, dynastic and economic ties. To understand the Empire's approach, we must turn back to 1914. The Habsburgs had spent most of the 19th century gradually being pushed out of their Italian holdings. The Austrian Empire had reached her zenith in 1815, but her territory had been in decline ever since. Even before the Great War, consistent defeats at the hands of France, Sardinia, Piedmont and other Italian factions saw Austrian dominion of Italy reduced to just minor territorial possessions in southern Tyrol and the Austrian littoral around Trieste. The keenness of the Kingdom of Italy to incorporate these rich Italian territories into the nation had led to one of the bloodiest fronts in the Weltkrieg. The Italian Field Marshal, Luigi Cadorna, had sent wave after wave of soldiers in futile attempts to take the strategic city of Gorizia. The Habsburgs held firm, and after the decisive victory at Caporetto in 1917, their armies were poised for a general push into the Po Valley. In August 1919, that exact push would lead to the armistice with, and subsequent collapse of, the Kingdom of Italy. Eager on reversing the centuries prior, Austria-Hungary would occupy Venetia and Lombardy until a full settlement was reached. Shortly after the armistice was signed, however, Republican-led revolts broke out against the House of Savoy. Although the uprising made rapid headway in the north of the country, unity proved elusive for the new young Italian Republic. Syndicalists instigated their own revolt within the Republican ranks, who were quickly pushed back to a small strip of land in Emilia-Romagna. The Italian Civil War forced an Austrian response. Both Republican and Socialist forces had been contesting Austrian occupation in the country's northeast, as neither accepted the 1919 armistice. It would be the fear of the Scarlet Spectre, that would drive the various anti-syndicalist factions into Austro-Hungarian arms. Under the Treaty of Trieste in 1920, the fractured anti-syndicalist Italian states were nominally unified under the pro-Austrian Italian Federation. However, in practice, only the directly occupied Republic of Lombardy, Venetia, in the north, would truly follow Vienna. Like Italy, Romania had entered the Weltkrieg with major territorial ambitions on Habsburg lands. Ever since the principalities formally united in 1878, Austria-Hungary boarded yet another hostile state that desired the incorporation of one of the empire's many ethnic territories. In the case of Romania, that was the prestigious and coveted Transylvania. After the 1916 Russian Brusilov offensive had pushed Vienna to the brink, Romania eagerly joined the Weltkrieg on the side of the Entente. Her goals were clear. A crushing Hungarian defeat would secure the annexation of Romanian Transylvania. The decision would turn out to be costly. The Central Powers unexpectedly bounced back, and a force of Germans, Austro-Hungarians, Bulgarians, and Ottoman troops swiftly overwhelmed the country. It would take only three months for this allied force of nations to take Bucharest. Romania, however, refused to surrender. Instead, the government retreated to Iași, 
where it fought closely alongside Russia and France. When Russia faltered due to the outbreak of revolution, Romania was left isolated in the East. Her fate was sealed when Germany negotiated Russia out of the war with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Alone and outmatched, Romania was forced to accept the humiliating Treaty of Bucharest. Austria-Hungary ended up demanding only minor border concessions from Romania. This was contrasted by the fury of Bulgarian irredentists, who demanded the new Lion of the Balkans claim much of southern Romania. The real winner was Germany, however, that secured considerable influence in the Eastern Balkan states with the treaty. Despite its relatively gentle treatment by the Central Powers, a sentiment of national humiliation quickly gained hold of the country. Rather than turning to syndicalism, however, Romania's population turned to the Iron Guard. Led by the young and charismatic Cornelio Geller Codreanu, this was an ultra-nationalist, radically anti-socialist, populist and xenophobic movement. To anyone witnessing the marches of the legionnaires in Bucharest, this much was apparent. Romania had neither accepted the results of the Weltkrieg, nor let go of her dream to unite all Romanians under one banner. Nationalism in the Balkans was an old headache for European diplomats. Such nationalism had, after all, started the Weltkrieg in Serbia not ten years earlier. As the Germans would later have it, it was Serbian ambitions on the Habsburg lands that would be the direct cause of the Weltkrieg. After rejecting Danubian demands following the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, Serbia kicked off a network of alliances that would end up radically changing the world order. Although it had initially survived bravely against the Austro-Hungarian onslaught at its borders, Bulgarian and German interventions would overwhelm the country in late 1915. As the Serbian government fled into exile, the fate of the combative kingdom fell to the occupying Austro-Hungarians and Bulgarians. Although the Bulgarians enforced their vision for their Serbian lands boldly and violently, the Austro-Hungarian occupation was as directionless as the nation itself. The belief of the military was that only a permanent and harshly enforced occupation could deal with Serbia as a direct threat to imperial integrity. This vision would also see small Austro-Hungarian expansion into key strategic strongpoints. This view, however, was not shared at home by either Budapest or Vienna. Then Prime Minister Istvan Tisza vehemently opposed any incorporation of Slavic lands into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, fearing it would only serve to further destabilize the domain and reduce Hungarian influence. Budapest would only support the incorporation of a minor strategic bridgehead into the Kingdom of Hungary. Vienna took an even more hands-off approach, preferably seeing Serbia as an aligned but independent state that would be bound to Austria-Hungary by economic means. In the end, amidst the internal chaos, the Austro-Hungarian army pursued its own policy. Serbia was being prepared for permanent military occupation. The country was demobilized, the education reformed, and civilian government was frustrated at any given opportunity. The annexationist policies of the armed forces would lead to a direct conflict with Tisa's Hungary, in which Budapest would eventually end up on top. After this tumultuous early occupation, Serbia would slowly be restructured in an Austro-Hungarian image. Pro-Austrian politicians, united under Vojislav Veljkovic, started working with the Austro-Hungarian occupiers to restore any semblance of a functional Serbian state. That said, the road to peace was long and arduous. Vienna had sworn a blood vengeance on Serbia, while the suffering of the Serbian people by years of economic exploitation had kept the population hostile to the Central Powers. By the time that Karl had ascended to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Austria-Hungary and the Serbian government in exile began searching for a diplomatic solution. 
the long and strenuous negotiations would eventually result in the Treaty of Vartolts. Serbia would be united with Montenegro, and the Kara Georgievich dynasty would be allowed to stay. Some territory would also change hands. The country would lose Macedonia, and the lands to the east of the Morava to the Bulgarian Sardom. Austria-Hungary seized the Montenegrin coast. More importantly to Vienna, however, was that Serbia would fall almost entirely under their economic hegemony. Like Romania, its people had suffered at the hands of the victorious Central Powers, and, like Romania, it had been thoroughly economically subjugated to the victors around it. Again, like Romania, Serbia felt humiliated and spiteful. The monarchy held an authoritarian and pro-Austrian position, which made it highly unpopular throughout the country. But as dissent grew, so did the government's crackdowns. By 1921, Serbia functioned for all intents and purposes as a royal dictatorship, under the iron fist of King Alexander II. Almost immediately, however, secret societies dedicated to the anti-Habsburg Greater Serbian cause rose up. The most notable of these, the so-called Conspiracia, would indeed end up tearing down the monarchy. In 1925, rising bread prices would turn the Serbians from dissent to open revolt. Mass strikes sprung up with a demand to end the royal dictatorship, the government's reaction to the strikes only increased the violence that swept through the country. In response, the king returned from his winter residence to Belgrade on December the 3rd. The monarch arrived in the capital to deal with the worsening crisis, but his efforts were to no avail. As the king entered the royal palace in Belgrade, he would be assassinated by one of his trusted royal guards who presumably had close ties to the Conspiracia. Following the revolution of 1925, Serbia quickly declared itself a republic. The new republican leadership, although far less pro-Austrian than the late king, would abide by the Treaty of Vartolts. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was, thanks to its own internal divisions and chaos at the time, in no way able to exert much power let alone intervene in the Serbian crisis. Germany, far to the north, was occupied with fever dreams of syndicalism, and so the Balkans slipped farther away from the grasp of the dissolving central powers. Begrudgingly, Vienna agreed to work with the new republic. Although a new status quo was reached, Serbia would remain ever restless. The growing Conspiracia movement continued to stoke the fires of Serbian revanchism. For Serbian nationalists and their allies in the government and military, the dream of a greater Serbian state was far from dead, merely on hold. Ever since her independence, Albania had remained an oddball within the complicated tangle of Balkan politics. Contrary to the quarrelsome Serbs, Romanians, Bulgarians, and Greeks, Albania's road to independence had been, at best, reluctant. Albania had wanted autonomy, sure, but only declared independence as a result of the ambitions of her neighbours. Rather than be absorbed by other Balkan powers, Albania sought international mediation. Plagued with anarchy and lawlessness, the European powers declared that Wilhelm, prince of the Protestant German Principality of Wied, would be the sovereign of the strange nation. However, upon his arrival, he was met with indifference at best and outright hostility at worst. Wilhelm's administration faced another crisis when Austria-Hungary demanded Albanian soldiers fight among them at the start of the Weltkrieg. Wilhelm refused, on the basis that Albania was bound to neutrality by treaty. Having lost the support of one of his major backers, the Protestant German simultaneously faced several Islamic and pro-Ottoman revolts against his rule. The German prince quietly left the same year he had arrived. Wilhelm of Wied joined the Imperial German army, 
but officially kept the title of Albanian sovereign. This put the young nation in a strange situation where it itself was neutral in the war, while its sovereign was not. Albania remained in a state of lawless turbulence during the first two years of the Weltkrieg as it became torn by various warlords who aligned themselves with different national factions. Despite Albanian neutrality, it was invaded twice first by Serbian troops in 1915, and less than a year later by the Austro-Hungarian troops pursuing them. Only with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 would the status of Albania be restored to any semblance of normalcy. As a concession to both Germany and Austria-Hungary, Wilhelm would return, and the Principality would be closely aligned with Vienna. For Albania, the settlement was doomed from the very beginning. Wilhelm continued to face Islamic, anti-foreign revolts, which eventually culminated in the Albanian Revolution of 1924. Under the leadership of the militant Avni Rustemi and the flamboyant Ahmed Zogu, the revolt took advantage of the permanent turbulence in Austria-Hungary to rid itself of Habsburg influence and establish an Albanian Republic. Although Albania had rid itself of its foreign monarch, the nation remained under considerable Austrian influence. Tirana's desire to remain independent and Vienna's need of a reliable ally in the Balkans would continue to keep the nations aligned in the interwar years. Strange times made for strange bedfellows, indeed. The Weltkrieg had only deepened Austria's massive economic dependence on the German Empire. Without the Kaiser's massive economic and especially military aid, the survival of the empire would have been doubtful. But while posters during the Weltkrieg showed the great empires of Central Europe side by side, under the surface there was trouble in paradise. The Germans' demand not to name the progressive reformer Josef Redlich Prime Minister in 1917 was a major cause of friction between the two kindred nations, and in the Austrian press, Germany was ever the boogeyman. Many went as far as to blame various political crises on German agents. The fall of the Austro-Hungarian socialists had been awfully convenient for Germany, after all. After Russia was forced to give up vast swathes of land at the end of the Weltkrieg, Germany and Austria-Hungary struggled to determine where borders should be drawn and how the new states would be influenced. Particularly Poland and Ukraine became contentious issues, with the two emperors frequently meeting to find a satisfactory solution. The empire had desperately wanted to bring Poland into its fold, but had found that in the end, the empire could hardly leverage their influence against the overwhelming military and economic dominance of the Kaiserreich. Despite Germany's protestations, Austria-Hungary managed to exert some influence over Poland by planting pro-Austrians in the King's Advisory Privy Council. Nonetheless, the presence of the German Kaiser's son on the Polish throne proved who was really pulling the strings. Austria-Hungary thus continued to play second fiddle in the new Eastern Bloc. They had gained some economic concessions, sure, but the new states danced to the Kaiser's tune, not a Habsburg one. The Kaiser's new Eastern map shifted Austrian influence to Galicia Lodomeria. This was a majority Polish and Ukrainian constituency inside the Federation. It swiftly became a haven for Polish and Ukrainian dissidents. Vienna harboured these rebels openly, in a bid to increase her influence, much to the chagrin of Germany. Economically, Austrian desire to free itself from the Kaiser's firm grasp and be a great power in its own right led it to pursue a course of economic nationalism. First, Vienna restricted German access to Austro-Hungarian markets by letting the Treaty of Salzburg expire in 1926. While these policies caused a mild rift between the two former allies, relations between Berlin and Vienna remained cordial. Whether the Central Powers could stand united against the rising threat of syndicalism remained to be seen, however. 
During the early interwar years, Austria-Hungary refused membership of both Mitteleuropa and the Reichspacht, steering an independent course. The empire was struggling, however, and the price of autonomy in a German-dominated continent was high. Austria's future was never certain. Countless times, the country had tried to rebound and rebuild. The tumult of 1926 had shown how fragile the empire truly was. The economic problems of the realm were alleviated, but never solved. The social democratic and later conservative policies had accrued a staggering amount of national debt. With her economy leveraged to the breaking point, Vienna and Hungary were always a minor setback removed from a full-blown financial crisis. The day of reckoning would come in 1931. That year, the Credit Sanstalt, the largest bank of the Danubian monarchy, defaulted one final time. It had reported a loss of 140 million kronen on May the 8th and was forced to declare insolvency three days later. What followed was a complete collapse of the Vienna Stock Exchange. People scrambled to rid themselves of their economic assets and shares as a run on the banks pushed the already fragile financial institutions over the edge. In what seemed like just three days, an era of stability and progress had come crashing down. In an attempt to alleviate the financial crisis, the Austrian government stepped in and restructured Credit Sanstalt. Unwilling to commit to radical economic measures, the conservative government split the shareholding between the state and the wealthy Rothschild firm in Vienna. While this prevented crisis from turning into recession, it made Austria-Hungary even more reliant on German loans. The fiscal strain of the crisis proved too much for Austria-Hungary to hold on her influence in neighboring nations. The revanchist Serbia, Romania and southern Italy acted swiftly to remove bankrupt Habsburg institutions from their territory. In friendlier states like northern Italy and Albania, economic ties simply dwindled into insignificance. By 1931, Austria-Hungary's fall from great power status was complete. Such a fall from grace would have been a crisis in the best of times. Unfortunately for Vienna, it came in the darkest days of the European 1930s. In Europe, the 1930s saw the rise of revanchist syndicalism and the resurgence of Russian nationalism. In Berlin, Budapest, and Vienna, the words Second Weltkrieg were never far from anyone's lips. If there were to be a Second Weltkrieg, the Empire's position would, cynically, be much like during the First. Austria-Hungary would be divided, unstable, and alone. Internally, Austrians, Hungarians, Czechs, Galicians, and Illyrians vied over the direction of the Austrian Empire. Despite all its reforms, the dualist system was still largely intact. The empire was as brittle as it was two decades prior, and its neighbors were even more eager for revenge. Once again, Austria-Hungary arrived at the same crossroads. Would it be able to resolve the issues inherent to the dual monarchy? Would the nation stand bright as a beacon of democracy? Or would it once again falter? weak and divided, and be driven back into Germany's arms. Darker tongues saw the turmoil in Vienna and Constantinople and thought otherwise. To them, the aging Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires were irrelevant relics of the past, living only on time granted them by Germany. The new world order that had emerged at the end of the Weltkrieg had already begun to falter. There was only one power in Europe still strong enough to hold back the syndicalists and Russians alike. According to such defeatists, there was no hope. There was no future. There was only the Kaiserreich.
against the machinations of the algorithm. Will you stand? Hi, the Cat Cinema needs you. Subscribe on YouTube and connect with us on all channels. What if Germany had won World War I? This is the premise of a legendary series of alt history mods called Geiserreich. Geisercat Cinema is a collective of artists making crowdfunded content set in this world of Geiserreich. Our Geiserreich documentary series explores the lore and world building of this unique setting in long form video format. Our video series are stepping stones towards a big Geiserreich artbook project. The illustration Testing. Okay, pre recorded Vincent. I'm taking over. Give me a second while I. Uh, uh, stopping this. Okay, I hope I got the live stream at the correct point. Uh, you should be able to hear me and not the uh, pre recording. Uh, but the media source is still playing, which means you are now seeing. Uh, just a quick mention of Kraut, who uh, was the uh, guest actor for this episode, as well as John Kava, Brian Jeffords. Uh, here's me and a little bit of promotion of the webshop, you know, as you guys know, guysgetcinema.com, uh, Patreon, uh, donations through PayPal, all of those are very well done. Most of all, you know, just telling people about our videos is perfect. Uh, I am going to kick off our Q&A. Uh, give me a minute while I figure out our Streamlab setup over here. Guys, at cinema patrons can make cameo appearances in all the I need to press uh, this one. Okay, we are back on webcam. Uh, I think that my microphone is on uh, music. And I will need a Okay. So let me know if this is working for you guys. You should be able to see me, hear me, uh, and hear a little bit of background music and then just you know, the documentary playing in the background. Uh, because we're taking it into a uh, Discord conversation with a few developers, Sky the Cat Cinema crew. Not everyone could make it tonight, but we do have uh, Gergel here. Uh, so let me see if I can get on Discord. Uh, joining the channel. Testing, testing. Hey guys, can you hear me on Discord? We're Indeed. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, Kergeli, are you here? Let me just drop Kergeli a message here. Q&A segment. Okay, Indeed. Stuck. Okay, so uh, we are starting a Q&A segment with me and uh, Kirkley have been gathering some questions that we received from you on various channels, you know, that was going to be community posts. Um, we did a tweet, we did, of course, a Discord, the guys get cinema Discord is generally, we have Q&A channels there. Uh, so feel free to ans ask questions while we talk on the uh, Discord of Guys Get Cinema or uh, just put them here in the live chat. Now, uh, uh, before we begin, I want to address one, uh, I think one of the most common questions that we're getting, uh, which is, you know, uh, what is the breakdown of future episodes? What are we making? What are we working on? I'm just gonna open a random board. And this actually is the development board uh, for Fly Maker and Print, which is our sister project. Visit that, design your own flag, print it. It's really cool. Uh, but I just need this so I can. For our FMP fans, here's a quick preview of the rework. I'm working on new GUI for FMP 3.0 to be released in 2024. But um, what I wanted to cover for you guys is. The uh, breakdown of the episode. So let's talk about so KR Doc uh, episode list. Now, uh, as you've seen with this episode, we are shifting towards one hour long episodes. So basically, what we saw now was KR Doc 6, Austria, uh, Hungary, uh, 
uh, Central Europe. Uh, I want to apologize if my keyboard clickety clackety is too loud. Uh, this is an amazing Corsair keyboard. I love the mechanical feel of it. Unfortunately, the microphone is attached right next to it, and it's very hard to actually maybe find. This is going to decrease my sound quality, but it should um, give you a little bit less of the keyboard thing. I still need to set up like a better uh, sound environment here. Uh, so then the next episode is going to be Kaiser Wagner Documentary 7. Uh, I think as I've said on the live chat, it will uh, focus on the Ottoman Empire. We don't have a title yet, so it will be Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, and me. So this one has been released. Then we are probably looking at uh, Kaiserwerk Documentary 8, which will be... Uh, so this, this all depends very much on sort of what the ongoing status is of certain reworks, as in what parts of the world we can use and what parts are too rough for us right now. Because obviously we do not write the mod itself, that is going to be the Kaiserwerk rework piece. What the documentary is, in essence, it is uh, an objective to create uh, accessibility in you know, the very vast, deep uh, lore that is Kaiserwerk. So that's why we put them in documentary formats, we put them in short formats and we make World of Kaiser Wife videos. Hmm. So, uh, Kaiser Wife Documentary 8 will probably focus on Africa and be called Heart of Darkness. So this is where we get uh, colonialism, uh, colonialism, colonialism uh, Middle Africa, uh, Collapse of British Empire, which is basically uh, a team that has started with Kaiser Wife Documentary Start and see what happens when the head of the snake is cut off. Then nine will probably be Asia. Uh, so it's possible that Asia will require two episodes because we do have we have Southeast Asia, we have India, uh, we have China, and you know, each of these is actually enormously significant in the second war. So for safety's sake, I'm assuming that this is going to be a uh, two a uh, two quarter. And then finally, uh, we get Kaiser Documentary 11 uh, or 12, which will focus on the US, and then maybe uh, 12 will be South Okay. So, so this is just a rough idea of what we're thinking about in terms of uh, Kaiser Wright Documentary episodes. And then, of course, each uh, documentary episode will come with an hour of original content will come with three to four actors generally which what we call talking head segment so guest stars will be invited so if you know someone who is a youtuber you know who does history uh, i think the collab with crowd was a lot of fun and it's, that's actually an idea that was floated to me by some of our community members really good idea and the uh, crowd was very excited as well mm. so uh Kegeli, if you're ready i would like to go over some of the q and a that we've been getting um can you unmute yourself or because i'm not hearing you right now uh, so everyone here Everyone on Discord, feel free to put yourself on the push to talk right now. So Titan Slayer um, asks an interesting question. Uh, that is, um, uh, Kingmaker. That is not an allowed. Uh, so, um, a question that we got from Titan Slayer is, what, uh, how will we get new people interested in Kaiserwerk? That's actually something that you know we've been struggling with a lot. Uh, generally, you can see that you know at Kaiserwerk Cinema, we've been very stagnant in terms of subscriber growth, uh, very stagnant in terms of reach, and uh, we've sort of reached that point that I call peak Kaiserwerk, where sort of everyone in the community is a part of this, uh, but it's very hard to grow. 
personally, I don't have like a master plan for that right now. Uh, my idea was just, you know, we still have so much that we want to do, so much content that we want to make, so we're just continuing to create for now. Um, we don't spend money on marketing or anything. There isn't money for marketing. We just you know, put it all back into the creation of videos. Uh, the Divided States is going to be slightly different now, so maybe that is going to be uh, sort of more of the entry into the Kaiser by War. It is going to be a more universal. Um, we are doing shorts, which I think is sort of a, the start of like accessibility, maybe. Basically, we're taking segments from the Kaiser documentary, we're cutting it into the shorts. Uh, so. Uh, can really, if you are trying to speak to answer those two any questions, I'm not hearing you right now. Well, I'll start. Uh, Ah, a question that's been asked is when the rework is coming. Uh, so from the developers, uh, the answer is going to be that Kaiser developers do not commit to uh, release dates, so the answer on that is going to be soon plus two weeks. For those asking if this was the rework lore, yes, this was the most recent version of the lore. Uh, we work closely together with uh, the developers of Central Europe, so this is... Uh, the documentary does not cover what your options are in 1936, but I think it covers... You know, um, the base premise quite well of what is going on in Austria-Hungary from 1916 to 1936 and where it will start. So we're looking at a country that is uh, divided, uh, not in a better position than in 1914, uh, surrounded by revanchist enemies, and maybe even more revanchist than they were during World War I, uh, with you know an increasing threat from Russia. Uh, certain nationalist resurgence it was a very difficult situation to be in with a divided nation like Austria Hungary. Uh, if you guys will excuse me for a second, I'm gonna grab my chair. I've been having a lot of lower back issues. I broke my spine in uh, 2016, so like staying in one position for a long period of time can be very painful. Just give me a second. So I've been uh, trying a bunch of things. To be honest, nothing is really working, but as long as I stay mobile, I'm mostly okay. It's uh, one of the reasons there haven't been a lot of live streams uh, this year specifically. I'm trying to uh, be careful with how much I'm sitting in the day, especially late at night when I'm this one. Um, so uh, for the people asking where you can ask questions on the server, you can do that in uh, Kaiserreich documentary channel or you can just ask them on live channel or on live channel right. uh, so Titan Slayer um, wonders how Austria is still in a faction obviously Austria-Hungary as it is represented in, in parts of Iron you see a bunch of different nations but if you would look at an actual world map of the world in uh, Kaiserreich in the timeline basically you would still see one nation because ostensibly a federated or confederated state is still a single entity politically at least in terms of foreign policy obviously there's a lot of divisions and it is possible for the entire uh austria hungary to uh, be broken um yeah i don't know if you can hear me now so so we wanted to make all um parts playable in mm. Reich. so that was the big part of why why it's still broken up on the map yeah, Kergali, I'm hearing you now, uh, loud and clear, actually. Uh, so now that you're here, Kergali, uh, can you introduce yourself to the community? Um, yeah, sure. My name is Kergai. I'm one of the Kaiserreich devs. I, I'm the one coding Hungary. We don't have anyone who's coding Austria or Illyria here, but I am the person I, you can ask me about those as well. Otherwise, I'm actually responsible for the Ottoman Empire and the Middle East in Kaiserreich, so that's where you will see me closing issues on the Git or usually letting my minions answer the questions in Ask a Dev on the Discord. Um, yeah, so that, that's me and I've been on the team for now two years now, so it, it's a long time and yeah, that's it roughly about me and if you have any other questions. Okay, so we're hearing uh, Kergili, who was actually instrumental in the creation of this particular episode. We also had uh, Vidya Rojak, uh, Gabriel uh, Flamefang, who helped us out a lot with this episode, as well as the rest of the Austria-Hungary rework devs, which is why uh, Kergili is here to answer some of these questions as they pertain to the Kaiserreich mod. Uh, now, Kergili, would you like me 
to send you the answers you've been given uh, in, in a DM or uh, are you able to look at my screen on the... No, 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 wait, you won't be... Uh, we're not going to be synced. Actually, can I share my screen? It's going to be easier for you if you can read the, the answers you wrote uh, from my screen. Let me try this and see if it works. Are you able to see my screen on the uh, Discord itself? Uh, I know I can't read it, but I'll just scroll up on the Discord. I had to go to my phone because my phone um, yeah. computer mic wasn't working. Uh, I, I just want to start from the top. Um, so the first question uh, is one that I asked today. Uh, Day now he cannot make it today, but he is uh, was instrumental in the creation of this episode. That is David, our Dutch editor, and um, asked him where some of the footage came from for this particular episode. He says a lot of it comes from the Internet Archive and Wikimedia. Uh, now, one of the things he did for this episode, because it's getting harder to source correct footage from Central Europe, is what we did is uh, use Travelog. So basically, um, American videos documenting daily life in Europe's many, uh, many corners. So that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. The very unique footage you see from Central Europe, Hungary, and stuff like that. Uh, so, Kergeli, um, the question here was, uh, what was your inspiration to drop the affairs of Central Europe? And Hungary in particular, uh, did you use historical texts? Did you use local media to extrapolate? Yeah, so, so, so I said as, um, in the chat as well, I can only ask for Hungary. For the interval law, we wanted to create something that's both markedly different from the historical history. So, you know, from that all that oppression and, and all the differences in thinking that the Treaty of Trillin induced into these people. So we wanted to avoid slipping into that. But we still wanted to rhyme on some major events, for example, the the 1925 strikes rhyme on the um, Battle of the Chain Bridge um, in real life that happened seven years earlier. So we wanted to do that. And for law, I, I mostly buy, buy history books in Hungarian and read those, um, try to get some interval documents, but most people write like they're crazy. So, so you know, you, you get too much into the either of the far, far away idlocks and then they, they just write crazy stuff and otherwise I, I tried to read some older newspapers but that's like really just for lore and and fun extra events not for getting to know what happened politically because sadly I, I have a job or not sad I have a job and I don't have the time to do this mm, okay uh, so another question we had on the animation front is how we did some of the uh, uh, the parliamentary animations that you see uh, specifically at the beginning uh, where we break down some some of the, uh, the formations of the parliament, basically. And this is uh, something that Dave, David, the editor, uh, came up with. Uh, here we went, started from the reboot documents that you gave us, Kergeli, and there the exact seat divisions are not described in the but what is described is uh, basic percentages or coalitions. We used that and historical parliamentary data and actually asked ChatGPT to uh, assign seats based on that so ChatGPT can do like some of this isn't that complex and have to read it easily and then we, we built infographics based on that. Uh, another question for you, uh, Kergeli. Let's go down for a minute. Uh, so uh, Hungary in Kaiserreich Documentary 6 is left under the Aponyi regime. Uh, what is the thinking behind Hungary post-1936 and what paths are available for players when they play this country? Um, yeah, so, so the, the, as the, the video ended with the Kreditanstalt crisis, so, so we, we, we went the assumption that the Kreditanstalt crisis could crash any government that's in power. So um, Hungary will just start with a one-year-old government of um, a liberal coalition and you will try to either keep that liberal coalition in power and, and to empower a Hungarian liberal state, or you will be able to um, go back, turn back time and, and ratchet up the conservatism if you fail as this liberal coalition. And if you fail even more, you will be able to do some rather radical things, but that's also up to the Austrians. So if the Austrians do not allow you to, to be radical by being stable and not letting Austria-Hungary crash, then you are um, left limited in your political options. That's I think I wanted we wanted to really represent that that you're limited in your political options. Whether what you can do as one of the subjects of Austria, you, um, if you if the Kaiser is there, there's 
there's a limited amount of choice for you. you you can only move within the democratic field yeah so it's possible for hungary to assert its independence from austria hungary through the focus tree um does it then uh, come into conflict with germany for example will germany back austria in a crisis um no so the any crash of austria uh, will begin with austria so any any um fallout um, from the, the only way you can destroy the current austrian hungarian setup is, is um, by austria um, so so that they will always be the instigators of any collapse that you will have in our case so that way you won't really come into conflict with germany because the austrians are the one who've done goofed up and then it's your um you, you might actually be uh, end up friendly with germany because you know as you can if you play the game the serbians and the romanians are just waiting for their chance to attack you and then the serbians and the romanians are usually also allowed with the russians and then you find yourself on the same side as the germans um <laughs> and, and so so you know um yeah what well, politics makes for, for weird alliances but um that that's the important point is that you as hungary cannot assert your independence through the focus you see there is no function um, no focus you can click that i i want to be free there will be um we will allow you to do it not just by um setting a game path but we will have events that you, you let you nudge austria towards the collapse but that's only to to make the gameplay better it's, it's technically all occurring on the austrian side and you will only be able to do it to uh ai of austria so if you have friends you want to play multiplayer with then you will have to talk about talk with them who um, that they actually do collapse the regime. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. Um, a quick question. Uh, Nicholas Wolf asked me to cut the uh, stream music, uh, so I turned it down by about fifty percent. I hope that the audio is a little clearer for you guys now. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, uh, Wolf. Of course, if you are hearing audio issues, please let me know because I'm not hearing. I cannot listen to the stream while I'm streaming myself because obviously the audio would loop infinitely. Uh, so let me know if you have any issues on your end. Uh, so, Kergeli, uh, continuing on that front, so you say that every any collapse with Austria uh, will co will begin with Austria itself. So, would would you say that Germany in 1936 uh, has no taste for you know adventures in helping Austria Hungary stay together, or is the Kaiser even you know um, does he see an advantage in a divided Austria Hungary, like a literally you know, separate countries in Austria Hungary? To be honest, I can't speak of German foreign policy. The way, I, only on gameplay terms. On gameplay terms, the Germans will leave you alone because they know you don't have anybody other, other to be friends. Like, you know, who are you going to be friends with? The Sindhis? The Russians? Uh, it's, you know, Austria is already very limited in its um, alliances. That's why they did ally, end up with the, the Germans after the Austro-Prussians war. So, so the, the geography and, and the conflicts mm -hmm. that they are in are already pushing them up against, and now the conflicts are even more ideological. So, so Germans aren't really caring about the Austrians until um, the Austrians really mess it up. So, so there will be no German meddling. You have to do it on your own. You you can mess it up on your own. The collapse will also not be in 1936. I I can let people know that it's it will be a bit of a later event. It's not like oh Black Monday now let's shoot each other. It, it's gonna be have some more grounded reasons why you will see the way it happens it, okay. it's not just take a focus and do it we also wanted to set up the the, the gameplay where you play the game how, how you do it to, to a bit later staggered because quasar is already so front loaded we wanted to push it a bit back mm -hmm. uh so uh another question we got is are there any armed resistance movements fighting against suppression of minorities so basically anti-hungarization minority revolts inside the greater Hungarian sphere? Um, so no, that's that's not the thing. It's the mm -hmm. greater Hungarian sphere. We've already had the liberalization, not even Aponya is bringing back the Aponya laws, as we just heard. It's There is no um, people who are like actually literally fighting. The Romanians will be allow, able to, through their focus tree and their decisions to, to arm resistance groups influenced by the Iron Guard, and if you mess up as hungry, you will be able to to get more resistance and, and be have the Romanians eat more easily empower these resistance groups. But at the moment, it's, it's not like you, there are two counties you cannot go into. It's there are is of course at it, it's, it's not like everybody is seeking kumbaya and its happiness in Hungary. Mm. Of course not. But it's 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 not come to the level of armed strife that's um, influencing your everyday life. 
Yeah. Uh, so another question I'm seeing here is where is the Czechoslovak Legion in all of this after the Russian Civil War? Um, so the Czechoslovak Legion, uh, I think there is, there used to be at least a Czechoslovak um, guy in charge of Transamur of all places. Um, so I think they're spread out. They, they, the whites won the civil war. Um, so they are a bit more aligned on that, but it, they, there's no way back to Hungary if you're a high level Czechoslovak legionary. Like if, if you are a high level Czechoslovak legionary, then, then you support a country that, um, that's, in, in directly in alignment against the uh, Austria-Hungary, like you know, the Czechoslovakia is not compatible with the way Austria-Hungary is set up. So mm. in that way, um, most Czech um, emigres or people like that have to leave and are in. I mean, they would have gone to Paris and now they have had to move on to Algiers or maybe in Canada, enjoying the weather, or just gone to America and work as a taxi driver. So. Yeah. You know, the choices aren't that great, to be honest, if you're a Czechoslovak legionary. Though at least it's not the Bolsheviks, I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, so a question from live chat here from uh, Queen Etik is, um, uh, is there a path to stay neutral in the Weltkrieg or are you bound to help Germany uh, with any of the Austro-Hungarian uh, you know, constituents? Um, so you are, free, uh, you are free to stay out from the crisis. Like it's, it's, it's expected that you will join on the side of Germany in most cases. That's, you know, that's how the game is balanced. But um, because most of, in the you know, 99% of the time, uh, the AI is playing the faction. But if yeah. you want to stay out, you don't have to. Just don't be surprised if the French decide that, you know, everybody needs to be liberated or the <laughs> Romanians who are now allowed, aligned with the Russians decide that they want um, uh, Transylvania really want it. And the Russians are like, okay, we'll throw in Galicia for us and then, then, then we'll get it done. So, you know, um, staying alone is, is, is a very dangerous path. Like, as we said, that Germany is, is one of the few countries without any territorial or ideological, real ideological conflicts um, with Austria. So um, you don't have to, just don't be surprised if the AI starts a war with you after they've defeated Germany and suddenly their German puppets are coming with thousands of military factories so it's, this, it's up to uh, you yeah so what i'm hearing is that uh you know you could try and stay neutral uh, in the second world war but if you don't go to the second world war it sounds like the second world war is coming to you uh kind of kind of you you might be able you know to to hash out the deal if if like the um the the russians are, are like like if there are some otherwise opposing factions you might get lucky uh -huh. so, so we are preparing for more other options but like the generic one is that that they might just be coming for you if you mess up. Yeah, yeah. So it is. There is a. Oh, so so yes, you. you um, um, there might be something like we are. We are still yeah, hashing that. Still working. Want, right, okay. And I'm also not not really wanting to spoil everything. Yeah. So we we cannot of course talk about uh, other reworks. We're going to stay focused on uh, Central Europe. Uh, so. Uh, a question here is, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Uh, so some angel draws has asked us why the Austro-Hungarian symbol has changed. So the Austro-Hungarian symbol uh, is moving from a simplified to this new version that you see in the screen. This is actually not the Austro-Hungarian symbol. It is the Spanish Aquila, which I, I had just added a crown to it. I just thought it looked nicer and it was a vector that we found. But we're shifting some of our symbols around as you may see we are always you know looking to update the visual style a little bit adding a few new compositions to that um these are questions about france which i don't think are that important ah yes uh critically for you question from youtube community uh the honor strike segment implies there's a lot of socialist agitation in both hungary and austria will a syndicalist path be possible for austria hungary um so as long as there is an emperor there is no syndicalist path and um, as long as there's an emperor, they're together. So that that's um, you cannot have a just simply um, an Austria-Hungary that goes syndicalist. Like the whole country cannot go syndicalist. You might have regions that that turn out to be syndicalist during a collapse situation, but that's only partial. Um, there is no way that you you elect the socialist and then you go syndicalist in the in the whole country, all five tags. So yeah, that's okay. not the thing. Okay, not a thing. Uh, scrolling down. 
So yeah, here's a question uh, that I answered before about the date for the Austria-Hungary rework. I just said soon plus two weeks as no date is given. Uh, so we can skip over that. Uh, oh yes, it's time to address our poster giveaway. So we are giving away one Austria-Hungary poster this week. Now, I was uh, just going to give a prize question, uh, real nice and easy, but then a user came into Q&A and uh, asked me, said like, uh, Vincent, taking no prisoners. He said, Vincent, you always do the prize question, uh, you know, do something original. And I'm like, okay, you want something original? Let's go. Uh, I am doing a uh, Kaiserreich Documentary 6 meme contest. That's right, it is a meme off. Uh, so, in the coming seven days, if you would like a chance to win a Austria-Hungary poster, propaganda poster that me and Hussar painted on the web shop, I will invite you to the Kaiserreich Doc 6 meme thread, which is a general discussion on the Kaiserreich Cinema Discord. Uh, basically, you will create a meme and will, the funniest, most relatable memes, obviously it has to be about the uh, war presented in the documentary. So we're looking for very niche stuff, very hard to understand if you haven't seen the documentary. Here's my own uh, addition. This is my uh, Karadovic uh, Doge meme. Uh, but feel free to add your own. We will put the uh, finalists and the top voted on a YouTube community post and the winner of that will win one Austria-Hungary poster. So uh, moving on to the Q&A. Looks like we're almost at the bottom of this, so it shouldn't be too much more. Uh, Roger McRoy asks, is what future awaits the Kingdom of Illyria? Uh, you know, does it play a major role in Austria-Hungary? Can it split off, uh, become a syndicalist powerhouse of the Belgs? I think you mentioned syndicalist pass are not possible, not even for Illyria. Um, so, so I said there is no syndicalist, you can't have a syndicalist mm -hmm. Illyria in, in the existing Austrian setup. Um, otherwise, Illyria is, is um, one of the... I mean, it, it's it's not the major powers, you know. You it's much smaller than Hungary or or Czechia or Austria, and also a lot less industrialized. But mm -hmm. you will have an op you will have options, and and you are also one of the few um, countries that has a really um, big gripe with Serbia. So you have an actual enemy, uh, and even though you want the same thing, because you can have an either an Lyrian South Slav state or a pro Serbian Yugoslav South side um, yeah. Slav state. So, so that they have really interesting conflicts, and now the question is, do they, if if it's collapsed and they're stuck alone with all those conflicts and all those enemies, and the Italians are looking to, oh, is, is there a Dalmatia there for free or, or um, the, the peninsula? And so, yeah. so, so there is all that, all that, those questions, and and I think Illyria, in that regard, ha has a major part to play. You just have to choose your enemies and your allies carefully because. You are not one of the stronger nations. Like Hungary has 20 mil core pop at the beginning. Bohemia has a lot of factories, um, to not say it nicely, and also just has a lot of puppets with which can build itself up. As Illyria, you have a lot less and a lot less to work with, a lot less to cook with, and there is no um, Belgrade pact backing you up unless you, you choose your allies wisely. Uh, so Roy says uh, Illyrian Yugoslavia or death. Uh, <laughs> um... There's a question here, uh, is there a syndicalist path for Romania? Uh, maybe it's just better if you know you address that. Uh, is, do any of the nations outside of Austria-Hungary in this rework, so that's Albania, Romania, uh, Serbia, have syndicalist paths available? Um, so, I mean, of, I mean, Romania and Serbia have both been reworked and are considered complete tax, so there is no work going on at the moment. Romania does not have a syndicalist path um, mm -hmm. if it's not. The, the, the way the country is set up, there is no way the syndicalists can come into power without um, a syndicalist power installing them. Serbia yeah. does have a, a socialist path. Um, I recommend everyone to play it. It's pretty fun. Um, okay. Just be good in the mini games, and, and that's it. Uh, so in Serbia 36, we're starting with Republican government after the assassination of the king, the Karadovic dynasty. Uh, so I assume the rest of the dynasty is quite a country. Um, yes, exactly. Um, the, the rest of the dynasties fled the country. It's um, and if you get lucky, you might get one of them back. But mm. Serbia is Serbia has been, as I've said, so we Serbia has been reworked. I think now a year ago or something. So it's it's a uh, it's I'm not saying old content, but it has been out there for a while because it's amazing new content and it's really fun to play. I recommend everybody play Serbia. It's a really fun country to play. Um, but yeah, so you you can get some courage of its people back. Um, into your okay. country, and they're now they're in Canada. I think I think that's the correct answer. Uh, so uh, Snowfox asks if Austria collapses, will the monarchy uh, be abolished? 
So what happens um, to uh, yeah? What happens to Coral and the Habsburgs in the event of an Austrian collapse? Yeah. So so um, they they have other countries to go. You know, the Karl is not only Austrian emperor; he's king of Hungary, um, king of Bohemia, as we've heard that there is a new king of Bohemia. So um, he has his other places to go if the Austrians don't like him. Um, so so I, I wouldn't say that he's he's automatically um, homeless, but there is, um, there is, you know, the people who are in charge might just take a uh, look at him and say like, oh, now we are without a king. Let, let's, let's do something interesting then rather than, uh, okay, let's restore the old order. So, so people, once again, there is choices, um, you know, as in that, like, if you know, these are very visual choices, having a king or not, it, it's, mm -hmm. you, you will still be, you know, if you're a conservative republic or something, but just don't want a king it still plays out very similarly. So um, we are letting these options happen. So you will, um, they, will, they will have somewhere to go in case of an Austrian collapse, that's for sure. Yeah, and not okay. just Germany or Switzerland or Madeira. Yeah, so Breakstone uh, basically repeats that. Can Karl remain king of another country if the country collapses? That's what you just said. So uh, Karl can become king of another constituency or, you know, has a few other options of where to go. Um... Uh, do Serbia and Romania have any uh, thoughts of restoring ties with the Entente, or can they only align with Russia or their own Belgrade Pact faction? Um, so I think there's some very limited ways you can join the Entente. Like, and if everybody around you is syndicalist, and then then and the Russians, as if the Russians go red, you can align the thing somehow with the Entente. But it's pretty convoluted for both countries. Yeah, um, and yeah. they're they're much more interested in, in you know pushing the gains. The Entente is far away, and, and in Canada, and have nothing against the Austrians at the moment. Um, so, gameplay wise, you're just very heavily pushed into the arms of the the Russians because they are the ones who are close to you, can support you, and and are looking to get the same done as you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a quick question about strife. Uh, so let me just uh, address that here. Uh, it, it's Titans there. Uh, so Strife was our live action short we released in, at the end, I want to say 2020 uh, Christmas or 2021. It was either going to be like uh, December 2020 or uh, January 2021. Uh, like what the plans are for a sequel. Uh, so as we mentioned, that was a very expensive project. Uh, and to do the sequel, what we wanted to do is you know go bigger but the problem is that really at strife we capped out what we can do in terms of budget so this is uh the only thing i have on strife to right now is a script uh so jordan has written a script we also have late connections with reenactors in the greater chicago area but you know we we looked at the logistics and we're just not able to have the budgets to do a sequel right now at least in live action so all we have is this loose sketch. Uh, the idea is that the sequel to Strife would be called uh, you know, Strife 2, uh, Northwest Traders, focus on George, uh, the brother, as he joins up with the AOS and then moves south. Very interesting story. Right now I'm doing the animatic. Obviously that's a lot cheaper because I can paint all the scenes myself, but we do hope to return to live action at some point. The problem is we really need a lot more scale and a lot more budget before that becomes feasible. Um, maybe that's a Kickstarter thing, but you know it's it's a bit in limbo right now. I have nothing to say about the project. It's uh, it's being uh, fridged, as we say. I'm not sure what the English expression is. Right now, it's being fridged, and uh, we will revisit it in the future when we have you know more availability of the resources. Uh, so uh, Daddy is here from the Ireland team. He asks, Kerigali, what is your favorite leader for WeWork Hungary? Uh, okay, so my my favorite leader is the Nat Pop one. I think he will. To many, to the surprise of many, he will be very well known for Hungarians. At least you've heard the name, I'm sure. And the, the writings are just insanely funny. Like, like he he is so off the rocks in some 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 ways. Like it's it's you know, um, it, it's very very interesting to 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 think to, to believe that people think like that. And it and it it's uh, it's just so radical ideas that like just so weird. Like why? And now we have a chance to bring them to life. And I think that's a very interesting one that like, like how people want to organize the country and that now it's like, I can make a focus that does make it actually succeed that you want to want to do something that weird. So, so 
it's a net pop one. I think it's really interesting. And I, I think with the Hungarian net pop ones, we are, we are shying away. It's not a legionary movement, so it will be radicalized people within the democratic uh, system at the beginning, at least for sure. And and I think we, we are being able to tell a really interesting story with that one and, and something that's like, you don't think about it because there is a conservative Hungary, just open a history book and you see it. Um, there is a liberal Hungary. It's, it's there. It's the beginning. It, it's you, you try to you know, imagine liberal politics is, is not that hard, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. others. Uh, and, and so, so that's, and syndicalists, there are tons of syndicalist countries out there, but like um, syndicalists are much more international in, that, in their thinking and therefore it, it's much less country specific, but the net pops are very often, you know, over patriotic and overzealous and just have ideas about their own people that, that it's not triplicated on the left. So it, it's very interesting. Not that I, I support these ideas; it's just very interesting. It's uh, you know, it's hard to to say it like that, but it, it's interesting, not good, to to make mm-hmm. it clear. It's not yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. these are good things to do. It's it's an interesting choice, and I think it's an a, a part of Hungarian interval politics that people have not seen yet, um, even if you're Hungarian. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, Thorpe asks, can Poland still align with Austria? Um, yeah, that's not getting changed. Poland has been recently reworked and it's a big path for them. And Austria is also really interested in in get, gaining more allies who are closer to them and where they have economic cooperation or influence, view it as you may. Yeah. Um, so question here is that, uh, so what does Karl, which, what faction or side does he personally uh, support, you know, in 1936? Uh, I actually never met the person, so I can't tell what really supports what we, we've met him. him what we're putting him as is a very democratic person, so he's very committed to democracy. He is trying to to make keep. He has worked hard to keep these con- turn these countries into democracy away from Hungary from, from what it was before and Austria during from the um, wartime dictatorship, and and he's trying to maintain that. I think that's his his real position is that. He is one, maybe he's not a meddling ruler in that regard. That he he is he he sees the people make a choice and he lives with it. And and I think that's his real ideology. At least that's one we are portraying. That he's someone who is in a servant of the country in such a way that that he accepts their democratic decisions and not the way he is. I know what country to invade or, or if you're doing what I'm saying. So it's it's not you know, um like there are other con- kings in Hoi Four who who talk into the game or like or their own personalities he's much back and otherwise because he's he's a, he, he's portrayed as a democrat and i think it's roughly fair to say it's um he wasn't king for long you know okay um so we have the full video releasing in 15 minutes so we're going to uh, cut this live stream in five to ten minutes let's say and then we'll move everyone over to the main release let me see where that is uh so we're starting to pick up some of the final questions uh question here can the iron guard interfere in austro-hungarian uh hungarian politics i assume austro-hungarian as well um Uh, hungarian mostly um but yeah of course they they have the option to intervene they have these decisions and there's some 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 way that will change. There will be, um, uh, there will be a way where you you can influence that, and, and that that's going to say stay. Um, yeah, so so there, there's sure you might not. There might not be any Iron Guard party running in Hungary, to you know the, the explicit idea of joining Romania. That's not really. They they have not liberalized to that amount. Let's say that. So, but mm-hmm. you will be able to influence it, and you will be able to try to um, get it back. So, so, so now the Hungarians and the Austrians will try to get back at you. Now it's a very one-sided affair, what you do in the game, but you will be able to influence them, yes, at the end. Okay. Uh, Krenetic asks, how many non-collapse paths uh, Austria has? Yeah, Austria. And I think Austria-Hungary wider as well. Uh, so, so Austria-Hungary, that multiplies. So that's... Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's a... Uh, not a three What's... three number, but it, it's it's a high it's a very high number if you multiply all of those you know who is free of what. Um, Austria will have more than one path for um, um, other than the collapse. There will be other options, but you know at the end of the day they're all um, democratic. 
because I've said that demo, um, you you can only go non democratic if you collapse. So mm. that that that's like there is lost less variation within democracy um, yeah. as gameplay wise, of course. Okay, uh, yeah, of that course. Makes sense. Excuse me for that. Uh, yeah, Thorpe says he was reforming our time limit on uh, Carl the Emperor. Um, ah, uh, Tor MC gives uh, a special sh uh, credit for the guy who deserved, the guy who made the new UI for the country select stream deserves a medal. Uh, I've been seeing that conversation on the Kaiserreich devlog. I thought it was a really good idea. I'm not sure who originally pitched it. Uh, I, th I think it was Amway. Uh, but really, uh, it's a really good idea to show like, you know, what nations have been reworked in a patch and then the way it's represented right now is like a, a lot better from the original because you have a lot of like very interesting miners in Kaiserreich and it's good to have, you know, segments that shows, you know, this patch play X country or Y. Uh, what countries will be on the select screen when the Austria-Hungary rework drops? Like what, what are your, you know, you must play these uh, tips? I mean, it's pretty easy. There are five Austro-Hungarian constituents, um, so those will be the five countries for sure. And mm. um, so, so that that I, I, that might already fill it a bit too up. So yeah, I, yeah. I think we'll, we might actually have a problem there. But that's the really music for the future, and we'll uh, let it decide. Uh, then, yeah. you know, so somebody will have to to you know make a new intro screen. Maybe I don't know. But but there are at least five 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 countries coming in one release for sure. Like we're not gonna release. Um, one country without it without one of the countries ready. So yeah. um, that I can promise people that there will be five countries that they can click into and play. Okay. Uh, so uh, in terms of paths recommendations, you mentioned the Hungary netball path will be a lot of fun. Do you have recommendations for Serbia, for uh, Austria, and the other constituencies? Um, I mean, for Serbia, I I think it's. Um... I know a liberal path is really. I, I think it, it was interesting to, yeah. to try to stay liberal in Serbia with all the revanchism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as for um, Austria, I mean, you can try, always try the collapse. That just, you know, that gives you a war to fight and, and to do it. Um, as for the others, I I don't want to like spoil the the other. You know, I don't know how much the other devs are, are keeping it under wraps. But I think every every country will have a good path um, to to try out, even if if. I think what's what's really an interesting phenomenon is if you stay as a loyal government, you know, somebody who is loyal to, to Vienna and is committed to the Austrian idea, and yet it's the Austrians who pull out the rug under you. What happens mm. to you then? I yeah. think that, uh, that 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 for every country that gives you your real um, dilemmas, and, and that mm. those dilemmas will be represented within the game, and you will have also why you will also have more options there. Um, <laughs> I think uh, so, 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 so I always recommend trying to stay loyal to Austria and let them collapse and then just be befuddled what happens now. Uh, so Gulash asks, uh, you know, will there be a focus tree for Hungary in the rework? Uh, maybe to confirm that, <laughs> I think it's an obvious question, but... I mean, I, I think I always, always wanted to say that there will be only events or only decisions, but no, there is a focus tree. There are yeah, quite a few so, focuses already yeah. created. So there is a focus tree. Yes, I, I can confirm that. Uh, actually, the uh, documentary is now talking about Hungary, so the, the footage is matching uh, the live stream right now. This this thing is just playing on the background. I'm not able to edit it in any uh, any capacity, so this is a, a nice coincidence. But yes, we have a Hungarian focus tree. Uh, we heard it from Kergeli. Um, scrolling down, I think we're almost through all our questions, which is actually good because we do have uh, the final video release. Uh, can Hungary align with the Moscow Accord if it goes independent? Um, yeah, I think I answered this one already in the chat. Okay. So, so it's not really rent net possible. It's, um, you know, the, the Moscow Accord is, is aligned with Serbia and Romania, and those want a big slice of you. And yeah. so that way, uh, it's, it's not really possible. And also Serb um, Serbia and Russia have been historically been, been aligned, and Romania was with the uh, Russians during the Weltkrieg. So it, it's not very likely that you will be ever find yourself in a position where the Russians aren't allied with people who want a slice of you. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't hold my breath for that path. Um, 
Okay, um, so uh, there's a question here on uh, you know a quick introduction video to uh, Kaiser Wang. Let me just answer that in chat. Um, so funny farmer, uh, here's one of our videos. Uh, are looking at uh, but go uh, to our channel page on the actual playlists. So, um, I'm seeing some questions about Alash Horda, but it's you know beyond the scope of this particular documentary. Um, yeah, that's it, Kergli. I think we have uh, most of the questions uh, answered. I'm just gonna give this score the last swing to see where we are at. I think I saw something with the, which American Second American Civil War faction yeah, was would, yeah, supporting. Would, would, yeah, yeah, would Hungary support? Yeah, um, I, th I think it's it's um, the democratic one. So yeah. um, either the, um, the the federals, if if they are democratic, or or maybe the PSA, um, mm -hmm. for sure not the Sindhis, or, or the longest are also. Then it, there's very little connection with the South. There's much more like most Hungarian immigrants were in Ohio and, and uh, that that area. So, but it, it, it they're very anti-syndicalist, so it, it's it's probably going to be the PSA or the yeah, USA. Yeah, yeah. Not very, not very interesting answers, but that's it. Okay, okay. Um, the final question then is, uh, what faction would Illyria join if they were independent? Like, what is their uh, their most direct path? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Probably the Reichspark, to be honest, mm. because they are in conflict with the revengeist Italians, who are very yeah. likely to. The now, now the the way the game plays out, the Sindhis are have the upper hand there. Mm. Um, they have a conflict with the Belgrade Pact, who is again, who is against the Belgrade Pact or the, or mm. the Moscow Accord, mm. the um, the Germans. So so I think it's 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 a very interesting path because um, you know the the whole way this the Central Europe is set up. It's it's you you have the Russians on one side and the Germans on on, on the other side. It's and if you don't like the Russians, then the, you might just have to go with the, the Germans. And Yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so we're five minutes out from the release of the video, which will also be the end of the live stream. Uh, Kergeli, I want to close off our Q&A section and thank you for joining us uh, on this fine European evening. Uh, do you have anything that you would like to add or say to the community before uh, we sign off on that? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you for having me and sorry for the mic issues. I hope it turned out and people enjoyed it. You can always try to ask questions in the yeah, the, um, Kaiser Reich right Discord. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and so we'll try to answer uh, or delay the answer. And yeah. thank you. Have a nice evening or, or afternoon or whatever you have where you are. Let me uh, just put uh, discord.gg if you have further questions. If you have further questions for that, uh, for all of, for the rest of us. Uh, so Kergili, thank you uh, for joining us. Always thank you for being such a wonderful part of this uh, documentary episode. We did a lot of, uh, you know, writing sessions together. You reviewed the script and I think I'm very happy with the final result. I think it's the best documentary we've done so far. Also the biggest project we've done. Great voice acting, you know, a lot of interesting lore. Very, it's very, both very broad and very deep, which is sort of what I would love to see in this series. So thank you for that, and for the great work on Hungary, of course. Ah, thank you, thank you, and thank you too for creating all of these wonderful things. Yeah, it's, uh, it is what we do. Uh, we do what we must because we can. What's that thing that Galado says in uh, in Half Life Two? Uh, so we have seven minutes to the Empire Eternal, and uh, this gives me a little bit of time to maybe answer uh, one question that I've seen, is when is our next music album releasing? Uh, so we have a few tracks on, uh, we're working together with a new uh, group, uh, Alpha Juliet, so these are friends of ours, it's a folk group here in Belgium. And uh, we're doing a few tracks together with them. Now the problem is, so here's here's a few of them. Uh, we have House of the Rising Sun, we have Never Go Home and we have No Pasaran. It's going to demonetize the stream the moment I turn them on, but I'm just going to put them... No, it's not that important. I'll just put them on for you. Uh, let me uh, end our music playlist. Make sure you don't have any background noise and show you uh, what these are like. 
So what we want to do here is we want to re record a video clip first and that is going to be after the release of the Vitus Ace Episode 2 which will be, probably be in July. So look, looking at the early uh, fall, uh, late summer. But we do have these tracks made so we do have rough recordings but we need to get everyone into studio because this is just, it's recorded on a smartphone so uh, it still needs more than it's actually a really nice ending to the live stream. And it's been a many a poor boy and God I know I'm one My mother was a sailor She soon I have more, but you know, this is actually a really nice, uh, you know, cool outro for the documentary. So I'm just gonna cut it here, guys. Uh, move to the full video release. I will put it in the live uh, chat. I will put it in the YouTube community post. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being a part of this with us. I want to specifically thank Kergeli. Uh, Vidya Roja couldn't make it, but he also helped to answer questions. And of course, David Day, the editor who worked on this episode. The incredible voice acting work of Patrick Warner, our main uh, documentary narrator. Then we have Ryan Jeffords, John Cava on the Talking Head segments. And finally, uh, YouTube star Kraut, our uh, favorite Austrian politician who played the Dominion in this one. Uh, that's it. I'm taking us out. I want to thank you all for being a part of Kaiser Cat Cinema uh, if you haven't done so already make sure to subscribe connect on various platforms do those things that youtube likes i will see you 
sooner than you may think for the release of the divided states episode two it will not be the fourth of july that what was what i was thinking but i'm still working on the episode i'm still working on that final scene you know things that i want to change i want i want to release it good you know i want to release it in a state that i'm like oh yeah this is cool um so i'm looking at july for the release date will be a release premiere live stream uh, i will keep everyone posted thanks for everything and i will see you for the next one see you guys Against the machinations of the algorithm, will you stand? Sky the Cat Cinema needs you. Subscribe on YouTube and connect with us on all channels.